If you uh, have been with us the last few weeks, we've been talking about our finances, and that can be a difficult uh, subject to talk about. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that God has a lot to say about our finances. And so we ought to also spend some time looking at that and understanding what it is that God uh, desires for us to do with our finances. And if you were with us last week, I got a little test for you. Uh, what was the main word that we chatted about last week? Great, wonderful, half of you have got it. Uh, intentional, say it with me. Intentional, great. One more time, intentional. And we spent a lot of time last week talking about that God wants us to be very intentional about our finances, that He wants us to be intentional about how we give and the fact that we should give. It's His anyway. We're simply stewards of what He's given to us. We should be intentional about how we plan to look after our family, how we, how we plan to use the finances that He gave us. And then we kind of ended that up last week and talked a lot about that, that intentionality when we walk through that with God of giving, of planning with our finances, that it leads us to a place where we can be generous with our finances, and that's what God intended for us as, as individuals, as Christ followers, was to be generous with the finances that He gave us. And we ended in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, we're going to start there. So you might want to flip there. We're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to pick up where we left off. At the very end, though, last week, I talked about this, that that generosity leads us to a place of rest. And I know that for most of us in this room, one of the things that we want in our culture, in our day-to-day -day living with our, with our families, is we're looking for a little rest, a little peace. Who, right? Am I, am, I, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Most people are saying, hey, when does this all, when does the merry-go-round stop? When do I get to just go, ha, huh, right? And God says that if I have a plan and I work out that plan the way that He intends for me to do that, that there's actually rest. Now the, the flip side of that is if I don't work according to God's plan, if I buy into what our culture tells us about our finances and how we use our finances and what we do with our finances, then here's the flip side, it's never enough. And I will spend my entire lifetime chasing after something that I'll never be able to grasp, never get a hold of. I think I've told you this before, but 10 or 11 years ago, I sat, I had uh, lunch with a, a gentleman who's an estate planner for folks who have in excess of five, five plus million dollars. And he's, he, he does estate planning for them, and we sat and had lunch. It's not because I have that much money, it's because I was curious. And uh, I wanted to ask him a bunch of questions, and he's a believer, and so I was just, I was curious about how people live and, and uh, how he helps them in, in the planning. And uh, I said, what's the one thing that's always shocked you every time you sit down and talk to people who have significant amount of money and, and, and the plan that they have? And he said, Tim, here's the interesting thing and the scary thing. He said, most people that I run into who are not Christ followers, and even sadly some Christ followers, who have in excess in their hand, we're not talking about their net worth, we're talking about what they have, cash, okay, or, or in liquid asset. He said, of five million plus, he said, here's the thing that I keep running into, it's never enough. It's never enough. He said, folks who don't know Christ especially are scared to death that it's not enough. What happens if? And they spend a lot of their time and energy trying to figure out how I make that get bigger and how I make that cause security in my life. And the culture that we live in says, look, if you can get enough, you'll be secure. But what is enough and when is enough? So this morning I want to talk to you about our finances. And I want to talk about our finances and how they affect our community and how they affect our church. And what God has to say about that. Probably going to come at this from a little different angle than what you might expect. So, snap your seatbelt. Here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Going to grab the same verses we used last week. Want to chat with you a little bit about how these work in terms of our church and our community. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud or to trust in their money. Let's stop for a minute. 
teach those who are rich in this world. Remember last week, this isn't so much a quantity of money. That's really not what he's talking about. He's talking about those who have figured out how to work according to God's plan. Remember last week we talked about that, right? 1 Corinthians said, look, plan at the very beginning of whatever money you have to give. Figure it out. Set an amount. Figure it out in your head how much you're going to give and go for it. Do it. Set it aside early. Set it aside on the front side so that it doesn't get stolen away by something else. But figure out what it is that you're going to do in your giving and do it first. And then we said this, God wants us to set a plan. And we went back to Matthew and we talked about the fact that he said, look, if you're getting ready to build something, you're going to build a building, the wise person sits down and counts the cost and figures out what it's going to cost, figures out the bills ahead and goes, hey, is this possible? Is this something I can do? Am I going to get caught in doing this? So they make a plan and they work out the plan. And we said this, that that when we plan to give according to God's plan and we plan according to God's plan and we use our money the way God wants, then all of a sudden we're wealthy. We're wealthy by God's design because we're using what he asked us to use the way he wants us to use. We become a steward of his stuff, his way. We're wealthy. Most of us sitting in this room according to this world standard, by the way, are wealthy. If you go around the world today, most people are living on, actually in third world countries, you're talking about between six and a thousand dollars a year. You catch that? A year. Go on, do your little search for yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about. In our culture, we waste that. Actually, I was having a conversation yesterday. We were shopping uh, last night, and I was standing in the deli line waiting. And uh, Justin and I, and Justin and Talia have this thing where, I I don't know where they get it, but they're always looking for change on the ground. And uh, they, Justin's standing there. We're standing in the deli line, and and all of a sudden, Justin darts off, and he runs over, he picks up a penny, and he comes back. He goes, Dad, I found a penny. I'm like, poof. And, uh, and then he disappears, and he comes back, Dad, I found another penny. And then he disappears, and he comes back, Dad, I found another. I'm like, where are you getting these? And there's a guy standing there beside me, and he goes, isn't it amazing? And then he goes, hey, buddy, there's another one right over there. So Justin went over and got it. And he and I start this conversation. He goes, isn't it amazing the amount of money that people throw away? And I said, it is. I said, my kids, we go, and they, they, they're always looking in places for cash not places they shouldn't by the way <laughs> just just so you know these are places they're allowed okay but they're always looking and, and they'll come out and they'll go hey dad I've got 46 cents so I I was reading I, I'm always reading interesting stories online and a little while ago I got reading this story about a guy in Sarasota Florida and in the past five years of walking around collecting coins 26 thousand dollars he has collected in the last five years twenty six thousand dollars he has collected isn't that something he gave it to a charity by the way by picking up what other people threw away so when we're talking about this and he says those of you who are rich Understand that he's talking to us. And when we use what God has given us, the way we're supposed to use it, we have excess. And so he says this, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Our trust should be in, what have we said the last little while? God. Our trust is where? God. It's not wrapped up in what we have. It's not wrapped up in our finance. It's not wrapped up in how much we have. We're not to be proud about what we've done. Our trust is in, in, one more time, God. Our trust is in God, okay? Now, here's why. Catch this. Follow with me. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Why do we trust God? Because he does what? He gives us what we need. He provides what we need. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, right? God, that's Philippians. He's going to give us what we need. 
So when we're trusting God, he's going to provide the stuff that we need. But look at the rest of this, because he doesn't just provide what we need. Look at this. Tell them to use their money to do what? To do good. They should be rich in what? Good works. And what's the word? Generous to those in need. Always being ready to share with others. So here's the thing. God says, look, I don't want you just to take what I give you so that you can use it for yourself, so you can have all the enjoyment you want. I want you to take what I give you. I want you to be a good steward so you can enjoy yourself. You can do the stuff that you want to do. You can do the stuff that's, that's fun for you, but I want you to have it so that you can do what? You can, you can help other people. You can be generous to others. You can share with others. You can meet the needs of others. Here's what God, here's the thing about God. Catch this principle. God is a generous God. It's his nature. Here's how I know it. Here's how I know it. God, all-knowing, all-power, creator of the universe, is so generous with his love that he saw me a sinner. I am a sinner. I am not always easy to get along with. I am proudful. I sin. I tell lies. I do. We all do. Everyone in this room are sinners. And he loved me so. He was so generous with his love. He gave his son so that I could have a relationship with him. You want to talk about a generous God? He gave me a relationship with him. He righted the relationship with him. I am the child of a generous father. My father in heaven is incredibly generous. And his idea for me to live a life of generosity, not a life of taking. And he says, look, I want to meet your needs. I want to bless you so that you, in turn, can bless everybody else. So you, in turn, can be generous to other people. I want to give you all of the stuff that you need to live this life so that you in turn can bless other people so they can see Jesus Christ. Look what happens when we do this. Always be ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future that they may experience through life. I I love this part because... People can say whatever they want, but folks, my father, my heavenly father told me this, Tim, if you work the plan that I've given you, and you use your money according to the principles that I've set up, and you are generous with what I gave you, guess what you're doing? What am I doing? What's the verse say? Storing up what? Treasures. The Bible tells me that I'm storing up treasures where? In heaven. This is not my 401k, by the way. That's not what this is talking about. What he's talking about is this. If you take what I've given you and you're generous with what I've given you and you work the plan according to the principles that I've given you, then you are storing up for yourself treasures in heaven with God. People say, hey, you can't look at it that way. I can because that's what the Bible says. It says, Tim, if you do this the way I asked you to do it, I don't know what the treasures are, people. I I don't know, okay? I'm not sure what that is. I'm not sure what it looks like. I just know that God tells me that if I do it this way, that I am storing up treasures with God, and I know something about God. He's generous, and if he tells me they're treasures, guess what? It's treasure, because that's who he is. He's never lied, and he's not about to start. So, folks, when you're giving to God, when you're being generous with your stuff, when you're being generous with your life, God has made a promise to you that if you're doing that for him, to honor him, you're storing up treasures for a future with him. That's exciting to me. Because here's what I know. I built a house 10 years ago. Great. Exciting, right? New house. Guess what? It's breaking. It's already breaking. I'm fixing it. Already. It's 10 years. That's it. 
the stuff in heaven, there's another verse that says this, that if I store up my treasures in heaven, moth, rust, and decay do not work there. They don't exist. And so the stuff that's in heaven doesn't fall apart. The treasures that I have in heaven, somebody can't steal. Because my heavenly Father is storing those up for me. I don't know about you, but that excites me. I have a savings plan for retirement. I don't think I'm really ever going to retire, but I have it. They say it's the smart thing to do. You know what? I got a statement last month. Guess what? I put money in last month, and I lost money. Who else was there? Yeah, if you've tried, you're doing the same thing I am. Guess what? That's the nature of it on earth. It disappears. But if we store it up with God in heaven, he makes a promise to us that it grows. That it grows. Because he's the father. Now, get your mind out of your money for a minute, because that's not what he's talking about here is treasures. Right? He's talking about eternal value with God. Eternal value with God. It's a foundation for the future so that they may experience true life, what it means to have real true life with God. Now, you may be sitting here this morning saying, okay, Tim, that's great, but what in the world does that look like? What's it look like for me to be generous with my stuff, with my money, with my time, with my energy? What's that mean for me to live out those principles on this earth? Let me give you some examples because you asked me, so I'm going to do it. You ready? Here we go. Here's the examples. There are people who get up Sunday morning and they grab a trailer and they hook it to their truck and they get here early and they set everything up and they're generous with their time and their energy to do that. There are people who hook to another trailer who bring all the kids stuff and they pull that out and they set that up every week and there's guys who, who run sound and there's people who run the, uh, the video equipment that sometimes work and sometimes doesn't and there's people who sets up our, our food back there and there's people who are running kids clubs right now and there's people who are doing the nursery right now and they're generous with their time and their energy and their talents and their money and they're giving to God. That's part of what he's talking about, giving away generously that which you have. There are people, there were 65 people from this church and, and some from the community that generously gave of their time and their energy this fall so that the fair could have people who ran the booze, who parked cars, who were greeted people kindly even when they weren't kind back. That's generosity. There are people right now who just have done 25 to 30 cord of wood. You'll see some pictures of them in a minute. They're, they're giving out pick wood to people who don't have enough heat for the winter. So they're, saw, they're using their trucks and their gas and they're using their chainsaws and their gas and their oil and their splitters and their trailers. And they're generously giving their time and their energy to give away something for the kingdom of God. There are some other people in this room, in this congregation, who generously gave a piece of land so that this place could put up something to affect the community. And so there are some people right now who have given time, who have given money, who have given some abilities to run equipment. There's somebody who has donated equipment. They're, they've donated finances so that we could start putting in some fields and some, some paths and different things that our community could use. But that's the generosity of someone's heart giving what they have for the better of our community and our church. That's what those verses look like. Those verses are talking about taking what God has blessed you with and using it for the greatness of the kingdom of God. That's what it's about. So if you're sitting here this morning and saying, yeah, but I don't have much. Oh, yes, you do. Oh, but I don't have a lot of gifts or talents or a bit. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. That's a pile of things that I just mentioned in a very short period of time that involves a whole pile of people for the greatness of the kingdom of God. You say, what is this really all about? What's it mean? Go with me to the book of Acts, Act chapter 1. I want you to understand why we do this. Why is this important? Acts chapter 1. Jesus is going to go to heaven here. He's died on the cross. He's come back. He's seen the disciples, and he's getting ready to go to heaven the last time. And the disciples are kind of wondering what's up next. Verse 8. And Jesus says this to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. If you are a Christ follower here this morning, the Holy Spirit lives in you. It's a promise of God. You have the Holy Spirit. 
And so he says this to the disciples, the Holy Spirit is going to live within you, and look at what happens. And you will be my, what? Witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here's what he's talking about. He says, look, here's the mission, guys. The mission is that you take your gifts, your abilities, and you go and you share who Jesus Christ is in whatever way you possibly can. For Holly, it's going to Turkey to share with those folks who Jesus Christ is. Crystal just got back, obviously, because you're sitting here. Um, from, her tri- from her trip to do the exact same thing. To share who Jesus Christ is and what he's all about. We have people that we support in Brazil brazil to do the exact same thing but we're asked to do the exact same thing in our community with the people who live next to us the people who we rub shoulders with who we work with who we live life with god says look i want you to be generous with who you are and everything i gave you so that my kingdom can grow and expand are you willing to do that see that's what our finances that's what being responsible with what god gave us is really all about It's using it so our community, our culture, our friends, our families, our relationships come to know who Jesus Christ is, the fact that he came to pay the price for my sins, to give me life, to give me hope, and to give me a future. That's why handling my stuff appropriately is so important. It's not so I can have more. It's not so I can look good. It's not so people can go, oh, wow, they have a lot. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with making the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus Christ real to the people that we live life with. So, I'm going to look at my notes now because I haven't yet. How you doing? Are you using your stuff? Your finances? All that God has blessed you with for his kingdom. I want to finish by reading a story out of Luke chapter 12. And I want you to just listen. I didn't ask him to put it on the screen on purpose, because I want you to listen to the story. Jesus is telling a parable about, it's really about him. But I want you to catch this, because it sums up everything that we've talked about here today. Peter asked for God to give an illustration of what Jesus meant as far as being a good steward. And Jesus replied, the Lord replied, and he said, A faithful, sensible servant is one who the master gives the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant thinks, my master won't be back for a while? And he begins beating the other servants and partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected. And he will cut the servant to pieces and he will banish him with the unfaithful. And he will be severely punished. At the end of this he says, when someone has been given much, there will be much required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. So Jesus says this to us. This is he's talking to us. And he says, if you're a Christ follower, I've made you a steward of all that you have. Because it's not yours. It was a gift from me to you. And what I've asked of you is that you would be found faithful with all your stuff, whatever it is, and that you would use it to the greatness and the glory of my kingdom, not yours. And if you do well at it, then I'll use you to do even more. And I will bless you even more to affect more people. But if you don't, 
there's a price to pay. When I read that this week, two thoughts went through my head. One was, man, I really want to be the servant who when the master comes back, he says, Tim, you're doing a good job. I really want that. I want it bad. And it's often my prayer when I get up in the morning, by the way, when I start my day. God, would you help me to use whatever it is that you bring my way this day for your kingdom? I start that off with that. But the other thought that went through my head was, We live in a country where it's really tough to do this. Not because we're persecuted for our belief in Jesus Christ, but because we have so much. And it's really easy for us to party and have a good time and become incredibly self-indulged. And I thought about the church of Jesus Christ in North America, and I thought about this, folks. We have so much that we really should be doing so much more than we are. We have so many abilities, so much at our fingertips. And I think we waste a lot of it. So I want to ask the question again. What kind of steward have you been? Of the stuff that God's entrusted to you. If you're being a good steward, it will affect our church. It will affect our community. Not for the size of Moss Brook, but for the size of the kingdom of God. Father, would you help us? in the days and the weeks to come, to be stewards who are found faithful, servants who are found faithful to our master with all that you've entrusted to us. Help us to use it in such a way that the glory of your kingdom is made known to the people around us. Father, thank you for the generosity of those in this room, those who have been touched by your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and in return have been generous with what you've given. God, give us wisdom in how we use all of the stuff that you've entrusted to us. Help us to be wise in the way that we reach our friends, our neighbors, our community for, for the love of Jesus Christ, with the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to be found faithful in days and weeks to come as a church body. In your, in your name we pray. Amen.